Uh, wow, praise the Lord. want to uh, move ahead here today into our message, our sermon time with the four horsemen and the seven seals. The four horsemen and uh, the seven seals. This, as we did last week, is also an opportunity for us to add an extra topic in with our Revelation Prophecy Conference which wraps up tonight. And so last week we talked about America in Bible prophecy. And today we're going to cover the four horsemen and the seven seals. Would you open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 8? Revelation chapter 8. A number of years ago in a Revelation Prophecy Conference, an evangelist was doing a meeting and he just shared a little funny thought. It was uh, from 1 Kings where he asked if men have to help with the dishes. And it literally says there, as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. So clearly then the men have to help with the dishes. So... One of the guys coming to the meeting, not to be outdone turned in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1 with what he claimed was proof that the men go to heaven 30 minutes before the women do. Let's look here in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1. This is, this is what it says, actually. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1. And when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Yeah, so that, that's obviously not what the verse is talking about. And I'm not the one that, I'm telling you what this other guy did. But I will tell you this, it's a strange text in the Bible, really, when you think about it. Silence in heaven. A place where the angels you would think, are always singing and shouting hallelujah and glory to God. A place where it's always happening and going on in the music and, and, and living and, and, and serving and worshiping God. But in heaven, there would be silence for about half an hour. And so... We're going to come back to this today. That's when the seventh seal was open. We're looking at the four horsemen today and the seven seals. The four horsemen are found in the first four of the seven seals. So we're going to march through them. And then we're going to come back to this verse at the end today. And uh, that is, uh, we're going to see what this is talking about. So go back with me to Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 5 verse 1. It says here in Revelation, we look here chapter 5, starting in the first verse. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with what? Seven seals. The idea of a seal is like a clasp or uh, it's, it's, it's sealed. It's sealed with seven seals. It's seven little locks or clasp on it, if you will. And um, seven is a number of completion or totality. So really, it's just totally sealed up. No access to it, right? And then it says in verse 2, Then I saw a throne. Uh, excuse me. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a... What kind of voice, class? Yeah, with a loud voice. Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. You have to open it up to, to look inside it. So I wept much. This was obviously a big deal. And, and, and there's a big search for who can open it up. And, and no one can open it. But they know that what it contains is really important. And so John the Revelator in his vision, it says, And I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But, but that's not the end. But, in the next verse, One of the elders said to me, do not weep, don't cry. Behold, we're in verse 5, the lion of the tribe of Judah, of the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. 
Now, this is intriguing. You have God on a throne with a book in His hand and no one can open it. But then, the Lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to open the book. Now, it's interesting. When he turns to see the lion, what does he see? He doesn't see a lion. He's told the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to open the book. And he turns to take a view. What is it I'm seeing? And verse 6, here it is in the Bible, in the Word of God. And it says in verse 6, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. Is it a lion? Or is it a lamb? Oh, it's a lion and a lamb. That's Jesus is the, the paradox. He is the, the, the lamb slain from the foundation that, uh, of the world that died for our sins. And He is the coming King of kings and power and great glory. He is the lion and the lamb. I, I love a song that, that uh, actually speaks on this very thing. He's the lion and the lamb. Beautiful song. One of my favorites to listen to myself. And so... We read on here and it says, It was a lamb as though it had been slain, having how many horns? Seven. And how many eyes? Seven. Which are the, how many spirits? Seven spirits of God sent out to all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And then uh, powerful praise begins in heaven that he is worthy and uh, we now going to just fast forward to chapter 6 where he begins to open uh, the scroll that would reveal the future. Now one thing before we go right into Revelation 6 and verse 1, one thing is that unless otherwise noted in Scripture or in prophecy, a prophecy always begins in the prophet's day. What do I mean? Like, well, if you've studied about the image in Daniel chapter 2, it began in Daniel's day there in Babylon with the head of gold and Daniel was there, right? You got the Antichrist beast in Revelation 13 that John the Revelator wrote about. And then uh, he would say the spirit of the Antichrist in 1 John 4 is already in the world. It, the, the inroads of that began to work in the prophet's day. Unless otherwise noted in Scripture, a prophecy begins in the prophet's day. Uh, an example of that, the millennium. It's otherwise noted in Scripture that the millennium doesn't begin in the prophet's day. It begins at a future point after the glorious coming of Christ. So unless it's clear it doesn't begin in the prophet's day, then what? It does. Now, as, as this scroll is loosed, right off the bat you have four horses gallop across the sky. White, red, black, and pale. And so, Revelation 6 and verse 1, the Lamb opened one of the seals. We look here. It says, Revelation 6, 1, Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked. And behold, a what color horse, class? A white horse. That's right. I looked, and behold, a white horse. Just a moment, I've got to fix this cord. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm tied to a cord there. All right, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. All right. Now, the seven seals, before we get into this a little bit more, just a little more background information, cover seven periods of time from the first advent of Christ. To the second coming of Jesus. And they picture the religious history of mankind as it makes contact with the civil, political, and military uh, powers which would become the history of the world. In fact, it shows the great apostasy of the early church and on down to our day. He opens the seal and there is a white horse. And so you'll see there in the picture, it's like a scroll and then it, it, it's rolled up in different leaved pages, and when you open a, a one of the clasp, one of the seals, then a section of it opens up. And so a rider conquering, 
uh, who could this be? Well, I believe it's clear. It represents the Christian church in all its purity in the first century. And it was a symbol that was very well known if a Roman general, as Rome ruled the world in that day in the first century, if a Roman general came leading his armies back to Rome and he was out front on a prancing white horse, you didn't even have to wait for the report. You knew what? They had won the battle. And so it was a symbol of a conqueror. And the church in its purity with the gospel spread quickly. Nothing could stand in its way. The white, a symbol of purity, uh, right? And of course, my friends, that's interesting. Now, some people will say, well, uh, I think the Antichrist is represented by the white horse. Well, uh, I want you to understand that the Antichrist the colors that are associated with Antichrist in Scripture, and there are some, are not white. Okay? All right. Now, we look here, I want to show you, there is also a clear image of a, a white horse elsewhere significantly in prophecy. It not only ties here with the first coming of Christ and the gospel going forth in the first century, but it's how the gospel era ends. In Revelation 19, and I saw heaven open, and behold, a here's another white horse in Bible prophecy. And he who sat on him was called who? Faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So elsewhere in Revelation, who is the rider on the white horse? It is Christ. Now, after the gospel, in, 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 in Paul's day, the gospel had been cre preached to every creature, the New Testament says. In other words, the gospel had gone far and wide as a testimony to the whole world. But, but in Revelation 6, 3, and 4, the picture changes. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come and see. And another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another and there was given to him a great sword. So this is the second horse. Kid sermon quiz. The second horse was what color? Red. And so you have white representing purity, but in Scripture, red represents bloodshed and persecution. Okay, and so you have from around 100 A.D. to around 313 A.D., a time after, you know, the, the last of the apostles have died, the time of the white horse, the gospel going forth, and now Rome begins a terrible persecution upon Christianity to try and stamp it out. Christians were thrown in the Colosseums to the gladiators and or the animals. They were given burn incense to Caesar. And if you would burn incense to Caesar, which was an act of worshiping Caesar as a god on earth, i.e. a false god, then you didn't have to, you know, go in that Colosseum and die. And if you refused, then you were, it was certain death. They would send you in to be torn apart by the wild beast as as the crowds gathered in the Colosseum cheered at what was happening to you. It was a horrible time. Persecutions on the Jews as well as uh, the Christians during this time. And, uh, you know, it was very interesting that during this, this time of persecution, the church continued to grow. Satan was trying to stamp it out, but it couldn't happen. Now today, oftentimes, it seems that Christianity can, can be weakened and compromised. And, uh, you know, back in those days, it cost you something to be a Christian. It could cost you your life. But the church continued to grow because uh, people realized this must be real. They are willing to lay it all on the line. There's no compromise here. And the historian Tortullian said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. As much as Satan tried to stamp out the growth of the church, it continued to grow. So we go to Revelation 6, 5, and 6. Revelation 6, 5, and 6. Here it is. And it says, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a what color horse? black horse so the first horse was what white the second horse is 
red. The third horse, horse is black. I beheld a black horse. Okay. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice out of the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius. It's a day's wage. And three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not harm the oil and the wine. And so you have a black horse, indicative of a compromised faith. Satan had changed his strategy. In the seminar one night, you heard me um, reference that. He changed his strategy. He pulled a Yosemite Sam. That's right. You say, wait, we're at church, it's Sabbath, hear the Word of God, and you're talking about a character. On... That's right, Bugs Bunny. Yosemite Sam. Bugs Bunny was always better than Yosemite Sam. I mean, Bug, Yosemite Sam never stood a chance. It didn't matter if they were flying World War II aeroplanes or shooting cannons or digging holes. It always turned into a competition, and Bugs Bunny always ended up pulling it out and, and being just a little bit better. You know this. You've seen it. And then at the end of the show, which always ended up to be right at 30 minutes, no matter what the competition was, they got it all wrapped up. 30 minutes. They came walking across your square TV before widescreen TVs were invented. And Yosemite Sam's beating a big bass drum and he stops right in the middle of the screen and he looks at you and says, if you can't beat them, I knew you watched Bugs Bunny. So Satan tried to stamp Christianity out with persecution. It did not work. The Christian church continued to grow, and a change came in the empire. He pulled a Yosemite Sam. The idea of instead of trying to stamp the church out through persecution, to bring compromise and paganism into the church, and then lead the whole world astray all in the name of Christ. If you can't beat them, join them selling wheat you see commercialism here this happened in the fourth and fifth centuries church the church was now upheld uh, by the nation by the state by rome and had financial support and church positions might go to the highest bidder you see and so commercialism mixed in with uh, with uh, church church history century 2 chapter 2 section 7 says christianity became an established religion in the roman empire and took the place of paganism Christianity as it existed in the Dark Ages might be termed, what? Baptized paganism. So paganism came in like a flood. I'm going to illustrate with two neutral areas today. Now, uh, this is shocking uh, to some of us, but I did say there are two what kind of areas? Neutral areas. It's important to share, I think, these two neutral areas just because some people struggle for, with how some changes would come in that were not neutral. Well, the very fact that these two neutral areas, why are they neutral? Because the Bible does not say not to do them or to do them. Now, in the Bible, if God says something we should do, that's not neutral. We should do it, yes or no? In the Bible, if God says don't do it, it's not neutral. You shouldn't do it. But there are things that we encounter in life that are neutral. Because God didn't, doesn't say you should do it, and He doesn't say you should not do it. So that would be a neutral area. And so I'm going to illustrate with one. It was in the springtime. We had it happen just a few weeks ago here. And so in the spring, as things were beginning to bloom in the northern hemisphere, you know, waking up from the winter, just the first hint of spring, and in some parts of the northern hemisphere, a good bit of spring already started, they had a time where they celebrated the goddess of fertility her name was ishtar and ishtar's day was the first sunday after the first full moon after the equinox now what is the equinox well that's the day in the spring and the day in the fall when the days and nights are exactly 12 hours each or the same length of time okay that's the equinox typically falls on our present day calendar march 21st so then the the ishtar day for the pagans would then be the first sunday after the first full moon after the equinox so on the equinox which on our calendar would be march 21st you'd be looking for the first full moon after that 
And then the first Sunday after that full moon would be that day. Does that make sense? Now, Ishtar, as the goddess of fertility, was worshipped, and there were a couple of symbols that, that were just really prolific symbols of fertility, even back in that day. The one was the egg, and the other was the bunny rabbit. Oh, yeah. I mean, aside from the cockroach, which isn't nearly as cute, the bunny rabbit is like one of the absolute, you know, you have two bunnies, you put them in a pen, they look at each other, and you're, now you're in the bunny business. I mean, anybody that's had them, you know. That's just how it goes, okay? And so uh, then, well, you know, as, as paganism flooded into the church and they were like, we need to get the pagans to come over to Christianity, they said, well, you know, you know what's like resurrection? Uh, excuse me, you know what's like um, fertility? And that is the idea of life itself. And life is embodied in the resurrection of Jesus. And besides, that was in the spring at, at Passover, which sometimes is really close to this day. And so why don't we make the day that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus this annual Ishtar day? Yeah, it's, it's now pronounced Ishtar instead of Ishtar, right? And the prolific symbols of the bunny rabbit and the colored egg stay with us today. That's where all that, what in the world does a colored egg and a bunny rabbit have to do with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus? <laughs> Not a thing. And so, you say, well, I thought you said it's a, a neutral issue. Well, it is. Here's, here's something you need to understand. The Christians should be remembering the resurrection of the Lord Jesus in their life every single day. You shouldn't wait to Easter Sunday and say, I'm not going to remember it on this day. You should be remembering it in your life every day, amen? amen? And I do special stuff, and our church does special stuff at that time, because it's true. There are two times of the year where, um, where people will be open to considering religious stuff and going to church that won't the rest of the year, some of them. Christmas and Easter, yes or no? As someone that wants to share the love of Jesus, I'm certainly going to take advantage of that. The Bible doesn't say, don't do it on that day. I'm not a huge fan of the bunnies and the eggs, I can tell you that, at least not until they go on sale after Easter, at which point, you know, it's a neutral area, sure. So, want to want to be a good steward and get a good, good price. Another neutral area that I will, I will tell you about also had to do with the, uh, the like, like the equinox, the opposite of the equinox is the winter solstice and then also the longest day in the summer. The winter solstice would usually come on about December 21st. And that would be the shortest day, longest night of the year. And the pagans who worship the sun, S-U-N, God, uh, they, they believed that the sun was leaving and that the sun had to come back or eventually everything would just get too cold and die on the earth. And so as the nights were getting longer and the days shorter, then as you head toward this shortest day of the year, they would uh, offer sacrifices and such and try to get the sun to come back to them. And the first day that they could tell with their instrumentality in that day that the sun had, quote, accepted their sacrifice and the days were getting longer were three days or so after the winter solstice. It was the 25th day of December. It was the renewal or birth of the sun, S-U-N, God. And so the days are getting longer, let's have a big party, and, and there were all kind of pagan rites and rituals that we won't talk about in mixed company with kids here today, but it was quite the um, party. And, uh, well, as Christians that were compromising were trying to bring in the pagans at that time, the pagans were already doing this. And see, here's something you need to understand about both of these areas, and before you get too fired up, because I know many of us like those times of the year, I've said these are neutral areas. It's important to illustrate with these because if these could come in as neutral areas and us have no clue, then there's some things that might not be neutral areas that could have come in as well. Do you understand? That is, that is a big deal. And so you need to understand that the pagans were looking for as many gods as they could find. It's true. Christians were dedicated to the one true God, 
Burn incense to Caesar? No, throw me in with the lions. That'll just have to do. Right? That's, that's where they stood. That didn't make any sense to the pagans because they wanted all the gods they could find. That's why when Paul in the book of Acts was at, uh, at Mars Hill there, he talked to them about the statue to the unknown God. They had all these pagan statues and Paul goes there as a missionary and he's probably looking at them and thinking, now how am I going to reach these people? And he goes to the next one, he's thinking, and then here's one he sees and the inscription is, this one's to the unknown God. The pagans, they worshipped every God they could find and they even had a statue to the unknown God in case in the afterlife they ran into a God they didn't know they said no we were worshiping you anyway we just didn't know you and they had a statue to the unknown god and so when satan changed his strategy of trying to get christians to leave christianity to paganism that wasn't working but he realized the pagans would be very open to coming to christianity and accepting additional gods and 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 renaming some of their gods with new christian names as long as they didn't have to give up the old ones. And so, it was the renewal of the sun, S-U-N God. They called it the, uh, the uh, birthday of the sun, S-O-N God. Even though we know, and it, it, it very likely, very strong case can be made, it was in September that Jesus was actually born. And uh, I've covered that in sermons here for you. Uh, so that's where it came from. Let's consider a couple things here. We're told by Eusebius that Constantine, in order to recommend the new religion to the heathen, transferred into it the outward ornaments to which uh, that had been accustomed in their own. Constantine was a pagan. He was the emperor of Rome. He converted to Christianity, had his army marched across the river, pronounced them baptized Christians on the other side. No, no, this stuff happened. It's historical. Not hysterical, historical. Okay? And so, he saw that Christianity and paganism were, you know, Christianity was growing, paganism was the religion in the empire, and there was controversy. And his solution, and historically, there are those that make the case that his, his conversion was political, for political gain. I know we've probably never thought that politicians were using religion to promote their, their agenda. Right? But historically, there may be a case that, that that's precisely what he may have been doing. Okay? And so, just, just some interesting elements. Okay, let's look here. Salvation through Christ was replaced by the requirements of the church. In fact, right here, this image of St. Peter in, in, in Rome with the little disc on top of his head, prior to you know, the birth of Peter, that was called Jupiter. They renamed the pagan gods from Jupiter to Peter. And, and then the whole system of saint worship initially had its background in all the other pagan gods. Just bring them into the church, hold on to those, and we, we call them by these names. And that's where the whole system came in. All right? You know what else came in during that time? The change from Sabbath to Sunday. It was causing a controversy even in commerce in Rome. And uh, the Christians, most of them were observing Sabbath. Some of them had to try to separate themselves from the Jews and persecution on the Jews had given Sabbath up and started to keep Sunday, not for a biblical, uh, not for a strong biblical case, but to separate from the Jews. And then you had uh, the pagans worshiping on Sunday. So you had Saturday and Sunday, and Christianity, Sabbath-keeping Christianity was growing, 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 growing. Slowly, the day was changed from Saturday to Sunday, but guess what? One of the leftovers of the change from Saturday to Sunday during this time period is in Rome where you were encouraged to take two days off instead of one. Why have a controversy over Saturday and Sunday? Why not just take both off? And most of you today still work a work week that goes Monday through Friday and your two-day weekend Saturday and Sunday remains in our world as a testimony of the change from Sabbath to Sunday I mean who doesn't want two days off instead of one I mean hey let's go for three what do you say (laughs) right and so then we go here to the dead faith and uh, the book of Revelation chapter 6 all right Revelation chapter 6 the next one got to move along here. 
We don't have our food here on premises today. That's next week. Notice I got my potluck announcement in there that way. And so we look here and it says in verse 7, When he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked and behold a pale horse. And the name of him who uh, sat on it was death and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them uh, over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword with hunger with death and by the beast of the earth all right the seal or a horse this is i know it looks white but it is a pale horse you have first a what color horse white the second one is a red the third is a black and the fourth is a pale horse all right. The seal or horse represents the time of a dead faith as well. The pale, the, the color of death, dying. The period of the Dark Age is a time of political religion. By this time, the Bible was in Latin, the classical language of Rome itself, not even one of the original languages it was written in. But the people didn't speak Latin. Only the trained religious leaders did. The common person had no way to access the Scriptures at all during this time period okay it was a time of political religion and the church had now gone from a white horse a conquering faith a red horse a persecuted faith a black horse a compromising faith to now the pale horse the color of death it was a persecuting faith the church had morphed into the persecuting power itself you can read about it in Fox's Book of Martyrs and look at the history of this where between 30 and 50 million people, million, million people uh, were killed by uh, the influence of the Vatican and the Catholic Church for the crime of heresy. They couldn't go along with papal authority any longer. And so here's a review to this point quickly now. The white horse was from uh, about 31 A.D. to about 100 A.D. The red horse from about 100 to 313 when Constantine took over. And the persecution was really severe those last 10 years from about 303 to 313. And then Constantine took over and everything changed. And then the black horse, the compromising faith uh, from 313 until the papacy received uh, its political power and began to dominate in 538. And that went, if you've been in the prophecy series studying other prophecies that overlap with this one until 1798 now revelation 6 verses 9 through 11 revelation 6 9 through 11 here it is revelation 6 9 through 11 we're on number five out of seven so we're making good progress but since it's um, five minutes after 12 you're not getting out by 12 just yes so here it is revelation 6 and verse 12 and I want to say, if you need to go, go. I know there are some people that uh, maybe have an issue of diabetic or something, and you need to go eat a snack at a regular time. We respect that. We respect your time. Uh, just not all topics fit in the same time frame. And so here it is in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood? Notice the reference specifically to blood on those who dwell on the earth. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest yet a little longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. So right after this time of severe persecution, this pale horse, comes the souls under the altar and they're given white robes. Well, a mighty reformation had begun. The printing press was invented. The Bible was translated into the language of the common people and became readily available. Yet there had been many martyrs leading up to this. But now, as the Protestant Reformation broke on the history of the world, those who were looked upon as heretics were now looked upon as good. White robes were given to them. What about the souls under the altar? If someone dies as a martyr, do they have an unembodied soul that gets stuck under an altar? Is that what it's describing? No. The Bible says the dead are asleep and know not anything. It's as indicative of the conditions that have taken place on earth. It's actually a reiteration of the symbolism from Genesis chapter 4. You remember your first Bible martyr? 
Who was your first person died for their faith in the Bible? It's Genesis 4. Cain killed his brother Abel. And God confronts Cain and he says, The voice of thy brother's blood cries to me from the ground. Was that symbolic of an unjust deed or was blood literally calling out? It was symbolic of the unjust deed. We see that symbolism of the blood now. Um, how long till you avenge our blood? That same symbolism picked up from the first martyr in the Bible and now reused here in Revelation 6. Now, Revelation 6, verse 12. We've come up to the time of the Great Reformation, and now we have um, uh, passed the beginning of that, and we come to the middle of the 18th, uh, 19th century, 18th and 19th centuries. And so here it is, Revelation 12, 13. Let me show you. And I looked, when, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Have you ever seen, whether it's a fig tree or not, a, a, a fruit tree or a nut tree, and everything's ripe on it and about ready to fall, and then all of a sudden it gets blown in the wind. Blah, 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 blah. You don't want to stand under it. Just, okay. It says the, the stars will fall, and it compares it to a fig tree dropping its late figs. And then it says, verse 14, Then the sky receded as a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. So let's back up here to verse 12 and 13 again. I looked when he'd opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a first a great what? Earthquake. And then the sun became what? Black. A sackcloth of hair. And the moon became like what? Blood. And the stars of heaven... Did what? Fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs. Okay. Now, it's interesting to look that uh, in history, right after the Protestant Reformation, there were some fulfillments to this. Now, some say, well, could they be repeated? Well, yeah, God can repeat anything he wants to. But the point is, they've already happened. Let me share this with you. And um, the great earthquake of November 1st, 1755, extended over a tract of at least 4 million square miles. First would come an earthquake. It pervaded the greater portions of the continents of Europe, Africa, and America. Have you ever heard of an earthquake in your lifetime that is felt and affects the greater parts of at least three entire continents? Wow, okay? Wow. Wow. Now, here's another thing. Almost, if not altogether alone, as the most mysterious and yet unexplained phenomenon of its kind in nature's diversified range of events, stands the dark day of May 19, 1780, a most unaccountable darkening of the whole visible heavens. It goes on to say that uh, uh, U.S. Congress are, uh, was in session, or maybe that was a state Congress. I need to go back and, and read up. I don't want to misspeak. But there was a motion to adjourn, and that uh, in the middle of the day, the chickens went to their roost. Never been explained by science. It's uh, under question still today. And then that same night, the moon was as red as blood, May 19, 1780. The moon, which was at its full, had the appearance of blood. The alarm that it caused and the frequent talk about it impressed it deeply on my mind. Stone's History of Beverly, Massachusetts. This doesn't just mean it was a strawberry moon or something, folks. This caused alarm to the people that they're talking. Did you see the moon? That was just, it unnerved them. It, it wasn't what we're seeing today and then probably the most remarkable of all the meteoric showers the stars falling was that of the leonoids on november 12 1833 the number was estimated as high as two million an hour for five or six hours charles a young professor at princeton university manual of astronomy page 469 now that's intriguing and um two million an hour would be like if you could see a mild snow flurry where the snowflakes are coming down, and you could stare out the window and see all the snowflakes you could for an hour without blinking. It's been compared to that. And nothing, there's been no other in, in recorded history that was like that. And then for those of you that have been studying in Bible prophecy, in the mid-1800s, we enter the time period, we're ushered into the time period known as the time of the end or the judgment hour from that time on. Remember that great prophecy? And, and here's one for you, Daniel 12 and verse 4. And it says, shut up the words and seal the book till the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. 
And when did knowledge begin to increase in the, hu- in, in, in the circle of humanity? The middle of the 1800s. It's called the Industrial Revolution. And so we're ushered into the end times. You say, yeah, but could these things happen again? Oh, sure they could, but they already have. Have you heard of reading between the lines? My friends, in this particular prophecy, because not every prophecy covers every detail. We've seen, you know, Daniel 2 gives an outline, but doesn't touch on everything. And the different prophecies, same thing. This one, no exception. Notice here, we are living, not reading between the lines, living between the lines. In this prophecy right here, Revelation chapter 6, verse 13 of the stars falling. You've got the earthquake, the moon to blood, the, um, the um, moon to blood. I meant the earthquake, the sun darkened, the moon to blood, and then the stars fall. And then in verse 14, then the sky receded as a scroll when it's rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of their place. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the commanders and the mighty men and every slave man and every free man hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? A great prayer meeting of all the skeptics, all the atheists, and all those who are not ready to meet Jesus, but they're not praying to the God in heaven. They're praying for the mountains and rocks to crush them and hide them from the return of Christ in power and great glory. Now, you know, many say oh, the seven seals are all in the future, but these signs that we just looked at take place in the sixth seal, and then the next is the second coming of Christ. Now, we also consider here Revelation chapter 7. It tells of a great sealing time, which uh, I believe uh, we very well may be into now. And um, we studied that some in our prophecy conference. And then we just looked at the sixth seal. It leads us to the seventh seal, Revelation 8.1. Here we are. No, this verse is not about men going to heaven 30 minutes before the ladies. Here it is, Revelation chapter 8. And some fellas actually out-talk the ladies. Yes, believe it or not, it is true. Revelation 8 and verse 1, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour. Yeah. Now, you know why heaven is silent? It's pretty simple. Matthew twenty five thirty one. when Jesus comes with him, he comes with all the holy angels. Yeah. You know why there's silence in heaven? There's nobody left there to make any noise. Heaven is empty because all heaven comes with Jesus. When he comes in the second time with power and great glory to come and claim his bride. But notice it's only silent for a little while. Now, could there be prophetic significance there? Well, certainly there is with the time period, but that's not even the point of this. The point is, heaven doesn't stay silent very long. Revelation twenty two let let's look there. Revelation 22 and verse 12, we'll see it together. Revelation chapter 22, last page of the book, verse 12. And Jesus says, and behold, I'm coming quickly. I'll give you another moment to get there. Revelation twenty two twelve. 12, and behold, I'm coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give everyone according as his work shall be. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. My friends, Jesus is coming very soon to rescue his people, to take them home to a place he's prepared and to spend eternity with him. Heaven is only silent for about the space of half an hour because when we get back uh, with Jesus, when he takes us to heaven, to the place he's prepared, when he gets back up there with all of his own, it is not silent anymore. The marriage supper of the Lamb, the grandest party there has ever been, is underway. And I look forward to being there in that day. What about you? We're going to have our ushers come forward and share a card with us this morning. We're all going to get a card. If you're a church member here, you need a card. If you're a Baptist, a Lutheran, a Methodist, an Adventist, a preacher, a pope, or a deacon, you need a card. Does that cover us all? All right, good. Let's all get a card here this morning. After they've got the cards passed out, they'll see if you need a pen. But don't wait on them for a pen. We can start looking at the cards first. And then uh, we'll have folks that need a pen raise their hand after that. And so let's go through this together. Want to make sure that you all get one? 
we probably need to just give them a stack at each row and let them pass them down so that we can get these passed out quickly, guys. Just give them three or four at each row, five, whatever, and um, we'll get that covered pretty quick. Now, it's interesting to consider this, that in the early Eastern marriage customs, you had the idea of the groom going away to prepare a place and that he would come again. In fact, in John 14, 1 through 3, when Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me. And my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there, you may be also. So the groom would go away and prepare a home for the, for the future couple. And then he would come back with all of his family in a big grand procession for the marriage and take the bride away to a celebration, the marriage supper at the father's house. Jesus leaves for a time of separation to prepare a home for for his people. And then he comes with all of heaven. That's why there's silence in heaven. To claim his bride and then whisk us all up to heaven to the marriage supper of the Lamb in the Father's house. All right, let's look at our card here today. If you need a pen at this time, raise your hand. They'll get you covered. And so we've got a couple up here that might need one. And so it says, I'm excited that Jesus is coming soon and I want to be ready. Is that your heart's desire? Are you on par with that today? If so, then put a mark by number one, a check, an X, whatever. The next one, I choose to surrender my heart to Jesus and obey His commandments. It's very clear in Scripture that those that, that uh, are fully surrendered to Jesus will love Him and keep His commandments. It keeps coming up in Revelation. I see the Bible Sabbath is the seventh day of the week, and I desire to keep it holy. And uh, that's an important step in our walk with the Lord. Uh, did you know that from the beginning, and I'm not going to take time to turn there, but you can write this down, Leviticus 23.3, that the Sabbath is called a convocation. It's the Hebrew word mikra, which means assembly. Now, there's many things we do to observe Sabbath, you know, which starts sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. We're not just in church the whole time, but it's God's assembly day. Even when we get to heaven, what are we going to do on Sabbath? It says from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me. It's an assembly time. Christians down through the ages have always known that part of the worshiping God every week was to assemble. They were doing it on Sunday in place of the Sabbath. Wrong day, but right event. God invites us to make it right day, right event. And then the next one, I'd like to follow Jesus in baptism, rebaptism. We've got some baptisms scheduled to start next week and then the next. And uh, we'll have them as often and as frequent as we need to. And, uh, you know, if someone wants to move forward and be baptized or rebaptized. Now, that doesn't include sprinkling because that's not biblical baptism. We talked about baptism by immersion, which represents Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And so uh, you can put your name, phone number there. I prefer a mobile number. And uh, because sometimes I just prefer to text these days and uh, check in with folks as well. And so name and phone number. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take this card and you can either fold it or just turn it upside down. And if you're in the center, I want you to pass it this way. And if you're over here against this wall, I want you to pass it toward the center. And I want an usher standing right here in the front taking those up. And then on this side, you'll simply pass it this way. And uh, an usher will take those up as well. Now, again, I just want to remind uh, you that tonight we have one final evening of our prophecy series. Our topic at 6 p.m. is why so many denominations? Why are there so many different churches out there? Now, if you look at just all the little divisions, I mean, I grew up in the Baptist church and my dad used to say the Baptists are like Baskin Robbins. There's about 33 different flavors. Uh, There's actually a lot more than that. There's over 100 different types of Baptists. And then all the different Protestant groups have splintered into little pieces. Why are there so many different churches? Okay, we're going to talk about that. We're going to see a prophetic answer uh, for that tonight, as well as what church or churches would be following the Bible the closest. And so then we're going to uh, conclude with uh, an encouraging, powerful message. Revelation 18. One says a mighty angel comes down from heaven and the earth is illuminated with his glory and this is a final message that goes to the world to prepare people to be ready for jesus to come and so we close tonight our final message uh is called um what is it called i just totally drew a blank 
It's about that, what I just told you. (laughs) It's about when the earth is illuminated with his glory. And the title has that in it somehow or another. And so if you want to see what it's titled, you can come and see. You know, it's kind of like you got to pass it to see what's in it. So you have to come tonight and then you'll know what the title is. All right. And so let's stand as we, well, well, I'm forgetting something, kiddos. I'm forgetting something. Kid sermon quiz, Dominic, yes. Okay, number one, what color was the second horse? Was it red, black, pale, or white? I heard a kid with a bass voice answer that one. Now, remember, there were four horses. The first one was what color? The second one was red. Okay, very good. All right, number two. What was the last Bible verse on the screen? Were you paying attention? I kind of slipped it in there. It kind of went back to the beginning. Was it Matthew 25, Revelation 6, Genesis 19, or none of those? Let's back up. Oh, there it is. Revelation 6, 1. All right, and the word today to check in with Sister Bev after the service, if you counted it, was horse or horseman. How many times did we say the word horse today? Huh? A lot? Well, Sister Bev has the official count. All right, don't forget about our uh, prophecy study. Uh, also, we have Sabbath schools going on, not trying to pull folks away from those. It's just another option for folks that are interested in it. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you for the opportunity to open your word and to study today. We thank you for Jesus and his soon coming, and that he takes us to a place he's prepared for us. As the Sabbath hours continue and we spend time with you today, we ask your blessing and uh, that we have peace and a refuge in this time uh, from all the, the, the cares and troubles and challenges of the world and the bills and stress that we can rest in your completed work. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.